good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us on tonight for Bible study. Please share this video with your family and friends. Jesus is real to me, and I hope he's real for you. Our scripture this morning comes from, this afternoon, comes from John 14, verse 6. St. John 14, verse 6. And it says, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus did not simply say he would show us the way, but Jesus said that he is the way. He is the one and only way for sinful man to get to the Father. And the way Jesus had to travel to that pivotal point in the history of the world was the way of the cross of Calvary, where his shed blood and selfless sacrifice shattered the immovable barrier between sinful man and a holy God. Yes, Jesus is the only way, the one and only way, and it is non-negotiable. Everything that is not of Christ is a lie. It's a deception. It's a distortion of the truth. I have truth, a partial truth. Without Jesus, we do not know where to go. Without Jesus, we do not know what the truth is. And without Jesus, there is no way to live or to face death. So with that being said, Jesus is real to me. And I am so glad I've got Jesus. He's not a fake. He's not a hoax. So many people doubt him, but I can't live without him. That's why I love him so, because he's real to me. When I opened my eyes this morning, the song that God placed on my heart was Jesus is real to me. Oh yes, Jesus is real. He gives me the victory. So many people doubt him, but I can't live without him. That is why I love him so, because he is so real to me. And if you don't know Jesus, I pray that you get to know Jesus and make him the Lord and Savior of your life.
Father God, we thank you now. We thank you, Lord, that you are real. We thank you for revealing yourself and yourself as real. We thank you, Lord, for keeping us and blessing us. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us, Father God, to come before you one more time. Lord, we praise you tonight. We honor you tonight, for you are good and you are God. We thank you, Father God, for being so real to us that you keep revealing yourself to us. And we ask you to reveal yourself to us on tonight through Bible study, that the Bible will speak to us, that you will speak to us, that your Holy Spirit will speak to us, that we will run on, Father God, and tell men, women, boys, and girls about how real you really are. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Amen. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for Sister Davis for revealing to us tonight the realness of Jesus Christ and taking us a step further with a brand new instrument tonight. <laughs> I said to you on several occasions that I have to learn to <laughs> learn to play the saxophone, but look like she's beat me to the punch tonight. And I appreciate her her giftedness. I appreciate her walking with the Lord and, and trusting in God and what she does. Amen. So again, thank you again for uh, being uh, here tonight. Thank you for being present in our Bible study. We are at Second Thessalonians chapter one. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Tonight we will pick up at verse number 5. Verse number 5 and we will conclude with verse number 10. 2 Thessalonians in the New Testament. Uh, the New Testament is 2 Thessalonians. And the verse that we will begin with is verse number 5. And we will end with verse number 10. Last week we covered verses 1 through 4. And we discovered that Paul, Silas, and Timothy are the authors here, with Paul being the general author of both 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. Paul is given credit for being the author, for putting the paper to pen as we know it today. We know that during those times, they didn't have paper and pen as we see it today. But Paul is given credit for being the author, the, the book identifies Paul, Silas, and Timothy as those who are writing to the church at Thessalonica. So the church at Thessalonica is under pressure. They're in the midst of hostility. They're in the midst of afflictions because of Jesus Christ. They are being judged. They are being tormented. They are being taunted because of their love, their newfound love for Jesus Christ. Last week, Paul said to us in verses one through four, the apostle Paul addressed the fact that uh, we are writing unto you, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church at Thessalonians, or the church at Thessalonica, to the church of the Thessalonians. He says, in, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he began by letting us know that Jesus Christ and the Lord, the Father, are on the same level. He identifies Jesus Christ as deity. He identifies God the Father as a supreme magistrate, the supreme divinity, deity himself. So he says to us, on last week, he said, and he says to us again tonight, that we must worship the creator and not the creature. He says in verse number two, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he puts them on the same level, letting us know that the Godhead is not only made of God the Father, it is also made of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He identifies two pieces, two parts of that Trinity tonight in God the Father and God the Son. And then he moves to verse number three where he says, we are bound to thank God always for you. It is fitting for us to thank God always for you. 
because of your tremendous growth, your extreme growing that you have done since you've gotten to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I asked the question on last week and I asked it again this week. Can your pastor look at you and see the extreme growth that has taken place in your life? Can the guest evangelist who came last year to preach to you, can he observe the extreme growth that has taken place in your life? Let me just share with you. Somebody ought to see that growth. Can your neighbors see that growth in you that has taken place over the last few months? Can this world, this watching world, this sinful world, look at you and see your growth and see how you handle pressure and brag about you? Paul says that I brag about you among the other churches. He says, first of all, I brag about you because of your growth. Secondly, I brag about you because of your patience. And thirdly, I, I brag about you because of your faith. Mm -hmm. We ought to be a faithful church, a church that believe what God has to say. Says to us tonight, the Apostle Paul, Timothy, and Silas, Silas say to us tonight, that we're going to have tribulation. Jesus says we will have tribulation. According to John 16 and 33, tribulation will be all around you and tribulation will be something that you have to deal with. But in the midst of sorrows, in the midst of pressure, in the midst of tribulation, you have to be patient and watch what God does. When we deal with patience, we have to understand that there's a process and we have to go through the process. If we don't go through the process, then we will not have great growth. Every child needs to go through the growth process. You can see in Broadway, you can see in Hollywood, those children who grew up as adults, who never had a childhood, who never walk through the process, their lives are torn apart. That's how it is in our Christian walk. We have to understand <clears throat> that there's a process of our Christian faith. There's a process of our faith in God. There's a process we have to go through. You don't expect the baby to go out and get a job the day he's born. You expect the baby to go through the growth process. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to go through the process. And this process that we're going through, it is filled with tribulation. It is filled with trouble. The process is filled with things that we don't want to deal with. But we have to go through the process. And oftentimes we wonder, God, have you turned your back on me? God, am I really your child? And you let me go through this? Let me tell you. When people see you going through the process and they see how you handle the process, then they know that you are a child of God. They know that you're patient enough to go through the process and they know that you have faith in God and your faith in God is going to take you through the process so you can come out as pure gold. <clears throat> Anybody who is patient enough to walk with God and allow God to be a blessing in their lives will be able to endure the persecution and the tribulation. He says, there's persecution, there's tribulation, there's trouble, but you've been patient. And because you've been patient, you've been able to endure. And that's what we pick up on tonight. Verse number five. <clears throat> As you are patient enough to go through the process, Look at what he says in verse number five, which is manifest evident of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. I really need to unpack this tonight because there are some who have misused and misunderstood this one verse. It says, this tribulation, this trouble, 
this persecution that you've gone through, this tribulation that you're constantly being bombarded with, you have endured. And Paul says it is worthy to be bragged about, to be bragged upon. Paul says that I've been telling all the other churches about the church at Thessalonica and how they have patience, how they're enduring the process, and how they are, are praising God in the midst of all their trouble, how they have faith in the Lord. He says, and because you have endured, this is what is the manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Now, first of all, we know that we are not worthy of the kingdom. So don't think that this is a salvation or a salvific message. Here, he is talking about sanctification and how we're able to endure in the midst of our sanctification, in the midst of trouble. And he says, this is the manifest evidence. In other words, we have evidence we have evidence of the righteous judgment of God. And when he goes further, he's going to explain that. But he says, we have evidence. We have endured. God has righteous judgment. Let me tell you, just hold on. Just wait. It looks like the wicked is getting away. It appears that the unrighteous are never going to be judged. It appears that those who are wicked, who are evil, is just having a field day. But when we look at Psalm 71, uh, 73 rather, when we look at Psalm 73, the author of the book of Psalm number 73, that author says to us, I looked at the wicked and I became envious of them because I saw how they were prospering. I saw how it looked like they were getting over. I saw how it looked like God was not judging them. He says, my steps had well not slipped. He says, my foot had well not gone astray. The author of Psalm 73 declares that I almost messed up and gave up on God. He says, but when I went into the sanctuary of God, when I went into the synagogue, when I went into the church, I saw that their end was destruction. Let me tell you, don't look at the wicked and think they're prospering. Do not look at the wicked and think that they're going to have it their way always. Because the fact of the matter is, God has righteous judgment. And God's righteous judgment will make us get to a point where we realize that we are worthy of the kingdom of God for which we also suffer. Now, let me just share with you. We are declared worthy. We are not worthy. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how long you saved. You are not so righteous that you deserve heaven. You're not so righteous that you deserve to even be called worthy. But what Jesus did, he declared us worthy. What Jesus did, he calls us worthy because we have been imputed righteousness. Righteousness has been laid upon us. Righteousness has been placed upon us. We are considered righteous. Not that we are righteous, we are considered righteous, and therefore we are considered and declared worthy. And this endurance in these trials, they don't make us worthy of heaven. People used to say that uh, out of all this I'm going through, I know God's going to give me a place in heaven. Let me tell you, because you are suffering, because you're going through trials and tribulation doesn't mean that you're worthy of heaven. The only way for you to become worthy of heaven is your trust in Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection is the only way that you can really, really, really become worthy of heaven. 
So our suffering doesn't make us worthy of heaven. A Christian may be worthy only through the grace of God. Only through God's amazing grace have we been counted worthy. And this grace allows us to receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. So no, we're not worthy. But the way we carry ourselves in the midst of tribulation, others declare us worthy, God declares us worthy, but we're only declared worthy through Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if you are a part of, of, a, of a church where you got things going on around you and you're making things happen and, and you may be doing things that are blessing the church. The fact of the matter is where there's no faith in Jesus, there's no worthiness. So the Christian is only declared worthy. But what happens is that trials and how we handle trials and tribulation, they expose what we already are. I believe, I believe that that former first lady, Michelle Obama, got it right. She says the presidency does not make us who we are. The presidency makes that which we are to be revealed. In other words, pressure, position in power does not make us who we are. It just reveals who we already are. When you have pressure, when you have prestige, when you have power, all those things, this combination, when we have persecution, this combination puts the squeeze on us and outcomes what we really are. If I put the squeeze on a lemon, guess what comes out? Lemon juice. It's what the lemon really is made of. It's really what's on the inside. So power, prestige, pressure, persecution reveals who we really are. It exposes us. And people are able to see our character. Our character emerges through the fire through the pressure, through the persecution. For which we suffer. The, the verse number five says, for which we suffer. We suffer for the kingdom of God. We suffer because we believe in the kingdom of God. Verse six says, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Paul moves into this realm of making sure that the church at Thessalonica and the Thessalonians, they understand really well, as they walk with God, God demonstrates his justice. He says, God is just. Look at what he says. He says, he says God will repay. He says, since it is a righteous thing with God, to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. I told you earlier, people who are doing you wrong, they think they're getting away. They think they're going to make it. They think they have it going on. But God in his righteousness, God in his justness will repay even the evildoers. Look at what it says. He says, because we have the confidence in God, than God, and we show evidence of the way we handle persecution. Now, you can't fall out every time you look up over every little thing or every big thing. People are watching you. They're watching to see how you handle it. You need to make sure that the verse number six, 2 Thessalonians chapter one, verse number six, resonate in your spirit and in your character. God will make a righteous thing happen. He will repay. He, he will repay with the tribulation by which they, they, they make you victim of. He says, 
He going to repay those who issue out tribulation. He going to pay them back. He, he's going to get those who give you trouble. Oh, saint of God, those who struggle to, to make you struggle. Those who are adamant about making you struggle. Those who make you suffer. God is going to repay. He says God is going to repay. And he's going to repay with tribulation. In other words, those who cause you trouble, he's going to repay with tribulation. Their tribulation will be greater beyond what they can ever imagine. Those who trouble you. Verse number seven. And to give you who are troubled rest with, uh, with us, who the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Look at what he's saying here. He's saying it's going to be revealed. Not only is God going to trouble those who trouble you, not only will God repay those who trouble you, not only will God repay those who trouble you with tribulation, he's also going to give you rest. He's a just God. Christians who share in this pressure can look forward to rest. This word rest means relief. You can look forward to it. God will give relief from the tensions of trials. God will give relief. Not only will he take care of the unjust enemies, but he's going to also take care of you. He's going to give you rest. He's going to give you relief. That's good news today. Christians who share in this pressure. Christians who share in this pressure and this suffering for Christ's sake. Now, you got to be suffering for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. You can't be suffering because you bought something that you didn't need, and now you're suffering because you can't pay your bills. That's not for Christ's sake. You can't be suffering because you made a, a, a decision either to stay with someone or to leave somebody alone. And then you want to say you're suffering for Christ's sake. The only way you suffer for Christ's sake is when you're doing what Christ has told you, told you to do. Many men, many women have, have stayed married because they believed in what Christ had to say about marriage. They believed what God had to say about marriage. That's suffering for Christ's sake. Many people have lost their job because they stood up for what was right. That's suffering. For Christ's sake. Many people have not gained what they wanted, a house, a car, because they refused to lie because of Christ's sake. Now, if you just make a bonehead decision, if you just make an emotional decision, you're not suffering for Christ's sake. God is not obligated to pull you out. God is obligating himself here to pull you out of trouble when you suffer for his sake. God is obligated. He says, I'm going to not only will I trouble those who cause you trouble, but I'm going to give you rest. <laughs> he says, not only, not only, verse number seven, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. God will send Jesus. Jesus will be revealed from heaven. Yes. Jesus is sitting in heaven. Jesus will be revealed from heaven. And when Jesus is revealed from heaven, he will bring with him angels. Jesus will be revealed. He's going to leave heaven. And, now, this is not the rapture. This is when Jesus comes in his second coming, he comes to earth. The reason why I know that, look at verse number eight. In the flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He identifies two groups here. 
He says, when Jesus come back, when Jesus comes back, he's coming with flame and fire. In other words, he's coming with an attitude. <laughs> After the church is raptured out of here, we've gone on to be with the Lord. Jesus will come back to the earth and Jesus will come back with an attitude. Righteous indignation. Jesus will come back with flaming fire, taking vengeance on those, the first group, who do not know God. Let me tell you, God has given everybody an opportunity to get to know him. In the last two years, if you have not gotten to know Lord, I want to tell you, you're in trouble. In the last two years, God has revealed himself in so many ways. God has shown kings, presidents, principals, God has shown everybody who's in earthly control that he has ultimate control. Yes. If we didn't see it before 19, 2019, and we still haven't seen it, you better check yourself. You're going to wreck yourself. It says God is going to take vengeance. Jesus Christ will take, he will come back with a vengeance on those who do not know God. Let me tell you, you need to get to know God. Yes. And you need to get to know him right now, right now. You need to get to know God. You can't go another day without knowing God. Because as I'm speaking right now, we all can be raptured out of here who know God. Those of us who have trusted him. He will come back with his powerful angels. He will come back with his angels. This Lord Jesus Christ, the man in heaven, will come back to earth. And he will exercise his power. You see, men think that they have great power. Men gloat in firing other men. Men uh, brag about how they shut him out and put him out of the place. Men get proud, get pride from, from having security come and, and push somebody back out the door. They believe, men believe they have great power. But let me tell you something, when Jesus gets back, he's going to come back with great power. Jesus coming will be with his powerful angels. He will come and, and when he come, his heavenly servants will carry out what he has to do. And it says right here in the text, it says he's coming back with a vision and he's coming to put judgment on those who know not God. The second group he's looking at here are those who did not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who hear the gospel but won't obey it. Those of you who are listening to me tonight and you are hearing the gospel, the presentation of the gospel is being made available to you right now. Jesus is coming back to judge those who do not obey the gospel. Jesus is coming back to judge those who do not believe the story. And if they hear the story, they don't take heed to the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me just share with you. There is no gospel other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. If any man comes to you, Paul says, if any man comes to you presenting any gospel other than this gospel of Jesus Christ, you dismiss him from your presence, call him a curse. Says those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus is coming with a vengeance to judge them. Look at what he says. First of all, he says, verses five through six, he says that there are those who trouble you and I'm going to take care of them. And, and then he says, you who walk faithfully with a God, who are patiently walking with God, I'm going to give you rest. Mm -hmm. Then he says, the third group, that when Jesus gets back, he's coming back with an attitude. He's coming back with a vengeance. He's coming back to take care of those who do not know God. And let me just share with you. The fourth thing he says, he's coming to get a group and judge a group who didn't obey the gospel. And what I want to share with you is 
He's coming to get those who he's coming to, to judge those who do not know God. And then he's coming to judge those who, who are disobedient to the gospel. And those who do not obey the gospel, their judgment will be greater than those who don't know God. You see, we are judged on what we know. He says, this will be drastic punishment. It will be drastic punishment. When Jesus, when Jesus come back to judge this world, verse number eight, at the time that Jesus comes back, he will punish both classes. And those classes are those who don't know God and those who do not obey the gospel. The guilty among those will be judged, but the, the latter group, the group who, who don't obey the gospel will be judged stricter, more strictly. Verse number nine, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Look at what it says. This is New King James Version, and it says, These who shall be punished, they will be punished with everlasting destruction. And they will be punished from the very presence of the Lord and from the glory of his at the word everlasting or eternal. This is everlasting punishment. This is people, this, this is a scenery where people will be conscious. They will know what's going on. And their punishment will not be like a whipping where it, it lasts a few minutes and is over. This is everlasting, eternal destruction. It is eternal punishment. It is, a, it is a penalty. It is a sentence to hell. It's everlasting. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Everlasting destruction. Everlasting, eternal destruction from now on. Eternity is from now on. And they will be punished by having not the presence of God. They will be absent from the presence of God. Let me tell you, this word presence means face. They will not be able to see. They will not be able to experience. They will not be able to appreciate the face of God or the presence of God. And let me tell you, if you are saved, you understand when you fall in sin, how bad it is to be absent from the presence of God. These that he speaks about will be absent from the presence of God for eternity. Whew. Everlasting destruction from the presence of God and from the glory of his power. God, God's great majesty. God's great power. We need his power. We need his glory. We, we need his presence. So we need God's presence. We need God's power. And most of all, we need God's patience. God, God has given us patience. He, he has given us time to get it right. God is saying that when Jesus gets back, he's coming with a vengeance. He's coming to get those who don't obey him. He's coming to get those who don't know him. And when I say get, I mean he's coming to judge. And, and it will be at a point where, where those who have not obeyed him, those who have not received him, they will no longer be in his presence. They will no longer have the opportunity to be in his presence. Verse number 10. When he comes... In that day, to be glorified in his saints 
and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. When Jesus come back, he's going to judge those who don't believe. When Jesus come back, those who, who don't believe will be judged and sentenced to eternal destruction. They will be judged and sentenced to eternal destruction. This judgment will take place when Jesus comes back to earth. He will be glorified through the lives of the believer. Those whose lives have been transformed. Those lives who have been changed from saint to sinner. The question tonight is, have you been changed from sinner to saint? Have you been changed, making you a saint out of a sinner? Yeah, we, we are saints. We are saints. We're saved. We're different. We, we, are, we are set apart. We are sanctified. We are saints. God and God alone can make saints out of sinners. You can beg your husband all day long. You can ask your wife all day long. You can never make another person a saint. Only God can make saints out of sinners. So he says, he says, that when he comes back, those who have walked with him, we will glorify him. And not only will we glorify him, we will be glorified. We have new bodies. We'll be changed. In the rapture, our new bodies will be changed. Verse 10 says, first, uh, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, when he comes in that day, to be glorified in his saints. It means the saints themselves have to glorify him. We glorify him in our walk. We glorify him in what we say. We glorify him in how we carry ourselves. Glorified in his saints. And to be admired among all who believe. We trust Jesus because we admire him. Let me tell you, I admire him because he took a took our sins and planted it on his shoulders and carried, carried it up Calvary's hill. I admire him because he was an innocent man dying for, for the guilty. He was a just man dying for the unjust. And for that reason alone, I glorify him. I glorify him. I glorify him because he has the power to take us out of here. He has the power to, to rapture the church and take the church out of here. But he also has the power to, to, to judge those who are not righteous. I admire him. He is to be admired. He's being admired among all those who believe. Because our testimony among you were believed. Paul and Paul, Timothy, and Silas says that we admire God. We admire each other. We admire you, church at Thessalonica, because you believed our testimony. Is anybody believing your testimony? Is anybody believing your presentation of the gospel? Maybe I should ask, are you presenting the gospel? We ought to be presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ verbally. We ought to tell people about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We ought to tell people that there is a real hell. We ought to tell people that heaven is real. We have to tell people that the choice is yours. You can go to heaven or you can go to hell. We should never, ever, ever tell anybody to go to hell. It is our responsibility to become the catalyst that leads people away from hell. Right. We ought to present the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The second way we present the gospel is through our lives. We ought to live the gospel. We ought to live righteous lives. We ought to live like we know the Lord. 
And as we live like we know the Lord, a waiting world, a watching world will see how much we really love him. And they will begin to believe. Paul says, our testimony has given you an opportunity to believe. Mm -hmm. I say to you tonight, saints that used to be sinners, your testimony ought to give other folk opportunities to believe. Your testimony, your testimony, how you carry yourself. Do you fall out on, on every little issue that comes up? Or do you say God is working and I can't see him working, but I'm going to trust him? Trust God. Trust what God is doing when you can't see him. Trust what God is doing behind the scene. Whenever you have a, a program going on, whenever you have a play going on and the lights go dark and the curtains are pulled, there are people people in the backstage, people behind the curtain that's working busily and, and quickly to change the scenery. I want to tell you, God is working behind the scene. He's working busily. He, he's working rapidly to, to change the scenery. He did it already. Mm -hmm. Over 2,000 years ago, he changed the scene. You see, Jesus the Christ took a tree and, and marched up the hill called Calvary. Jesus Christ died for you and for me. Before his death, men, ordinary men, preachers, ordinary priests would go behind the curtain and they would, they would, they would make intercession behind that veil for mankind. But when Jesus died on Calvary, the veil of the temple was torn. It was ripped. It was destroyed from top to bottom. Now we don't have to go and depend on the preacher to make intercession for us. We can go boldly before the Lord Jesus Christ, go boldly before God on our behalf. Yes. The great high priest, Jesus Christ, has made a way out of nowhere. He has enabled us to go from sinner to saint. He has enabled us to plead our own case before the Lord. It's because of somebody's testimony that we believe Jesus. I say to you tonight, you need to trust him. You need to believe Jesus. And it's not very much. Just believe the story. Just believe the gospel. The gospel is good news. The good news is that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for you and for me on a skull hill called Calvary. Over 2,000 years ago, a, an innocent man gave his life for you and for me. Jesus Christ, over 2,000 years ago, died on a tree. Yes, he did. He died on a skull hill called Calvary. They, they nailed him tight. They riveted him to the wood. He died for you and he died for me. Jesus did. They took him off the cross, laid him in a borrowed tomb. And they laid him in that tomb and he stayed there. But on the third day morning, he rose with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. That same Jesus who rose from the dead is in heaven now. He's making intercessions for you and me. As we confess our sins, we ask for forgiveness. He, he gives us another chance. He tells God, God, give them another chance. Let me tell you, God is giving you that chance tonight. You need to trust him. Because one of these days, Jesus is going to crack the sky. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who are still alive will be caught up with him in mid-air. And the Bible says we will forever be with the Lord. 
as the text has declared, those who, who don't know the Lord, those who do not obey the gospel, they will be eternally destroyed. There will be total everlasting destruction. But the good news is, if you can trust him tonight, if you can believe the story, if you can start obeying him tonight, you can be saved right here, right now. Will you trust him tonight? Will you believe upon the Lord Jesus? Just believe the story, the gospel. If you can believe this story, will you join me in prayer? Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. <clears throat> I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new creature. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe if you prayed that prayer, we believe that you're born again. We believe if you, you believe the story and you trust Jesus to be the only person that can make you worthy and can make you qualify for heaven. We believe that if you trust in Jesus tonight, you're now saved. You're born again. If you die, regardless of this is now or later, you're on your way to heaven. You just missed hell. There may be others of us who are struggling with our testimony struggling with life. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for me. I'm not the only one. Matter of fact, all of us are. We struggle with life. We struggle with tribulation. We tr struggle with trouble. I want to ask God to allow us to redeem ourselves for Christ has redeemed us. I want to ask us to bow with me and ask Jesus Christ to forgive us. Father God, I ask you to forgive us now. We believe that you are the great judge. You are the awesome high king. We come confessing our sins. We've fallen short. We messed up. We have been, been disobedient to your word. We have disconnected from you, Father God. Whether it's in sin or we just walked away, we ask you to forgive us. Renew a right spirit within us. And bless us, Father God, to reconnect to you, rededicate, renew and repent. And we thank you now for blessing us and forgiving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. If you are looking for a church home, I recommend this one where Jesus Christ is the center of attention and the main attraction. The New Beginning Church in Southeast Houston. You can join by just inboxing me and letting me know and I'll send you all the paperwork or whatever you need to be a member. You can join locally or you can join globally. We welcome you to the New Beginning Church where there are no perfect people, but we worship a perfect God. Inbox me if you have received Christ tonight. I'd like to know and celebrate with you. Inbox me if you'd like to join the New Beginning Church. We want to welcome you to the family of faith. And inbox me and let me know that you've uh, repented, rededicated, renewed your your right fellowship with God. I like to know. I like to be encouragement to you to keep running on. Remember now, trouble and tribulation will always be present. But Jesus has already fixed it. We need to hang in there and hold on. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being a part of our service. 
it is now offering time. If you want to give to this ministry, you can do so electronically or by mail. You can send your tithes, your love offering. You can send your gifts. You can send your sacrificial gifts to New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Or you can send it by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. That's lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. That's our Zelle account. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Again, thank you for being a part of our service. Let's pray over our offering. Lord, we thank you. We bless your name. We thank you for every giver. We thank you for every gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. Thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you for being here tonight. Please, ma'am, please, sir, let's keep praying for the Vasquez family. We're going to keep lifting them in prayer. Keep them before the Lord as they struggle with this awful disease. About five members of this family are struggling with this disease. We want to pray for the Hemingway, the Woods family. We want to lift them before the Lord as they seek to bury another family member of mine as a result of COVID-19. I want to say to us tonight, take it seriously. Take it seriously. Get your vaccine. <laughs> Wear your mask, wash your hands, sanitize your hands, stay out of crowds, make sure you keep good hygiene practices up. Obey the science, obey the doctor. There's about 39, 39 women who are pregnant with COVID-19 in one hospital, and none of them have the vaccine. I'm at the point of getting ready to take my third vaccine now and I'm still living. I want you to take the first two. <laughs> we need to make sure that we cover ourselves. Family members around us are dying. Neighbors are dying. Church members are dying. We need to take the vaccine. As I said, I'm getting ready to take my third one. Sister David's getting ready to take her third one. It's time for you to get it. Let's trust God. And as we trust him, let's do everything humanly possible to make sure we stay safe, to make sure that we do what we can do. We leave the, the rest to God. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for being a part of this service. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We honor you. We praise you. We pray for the best quest family. We ask you to heal them and keep them. We pray, Father God, for the Woods and the Wallace and the, the Hemingway family. Lord, we ask you to comfort us as members of the family continue to go through the process. We believe you, God, that you are faithful and you're the great physician. Not unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him, the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you. Peace out.